Hello, my name's Johnny Cullen, and I normally write about games for the likes of VG247, Official PlayStation Magazine UK, and Eurogamer. But this time I've decided to do something different that explores games in a different way. Um, I've decided to do a podcast. Yay! Um, I've done a couple of these in the past about silly things, but they're not really edited very well. Um, this time I wanted to, you know, properly go for it and have, you know, a decent podcast with proper editing ish. And uh this is the effort of that said um these are the efforts of it and it's called My Favourite Game. My favourite game came about because of the uh Tone Control podcast that was made uh a while back on Idle Funds by Steve Gaynor, uh who you'll know from the Fulbright company who made Gone Home. And uh, I occasionally listen to these, some of these episodes, but the one episode that sticks out for me is uh, the episode with Neil Druckmann, the creative director at Naughty Dog, who was uh, one half of the pair who spearheaded the development on my favourite game ever, The Last of Us. So that episode kind of inspired me to ask fellow folk in the industry, in the UK games industry anyways, what their favourite game was. So um, for this season anyways, which is all going to be um, writers and video personalities, um, what their favourite game was. I, wa I, wa I went to them and, you know, wanted them to explain what their favourite game was, why they fell in love with that game, and uh, other bits and bobs in between. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of the basis of this podcast, and uh, I'll shut up now because if I babble on too long, you're going to turn it off. So, uh, please don't turn it off. Um, in fact, don't turn it off for the next few weeks because these are going to be coming out weekly and uh, I hope you'll enjoy these. I really hope you will. So uh, yeah, please forgive me by the way if this first episode is slightly rough in the dust, in the, in the dust basically, pardon our dust basically, um, but this is kind of the pilot episode. Anyways, I'll shut up now, I'll shut up, I'll shut up. Um, please enjoy this first episode of my favourite game. Uh, which is with Ben Cordell of Stick Twillers, and I hope you'll enjoy future episodes in the weeks ahead. And uh, if this goes well, uh, well, I'll see about maybe doing more of these. But otherwise, please enjoy this episode of My Favorite Game, and I hope you'll hopefully tune in to future episodes in this upcoming season. Thank you, and enjoy. Ben Cordell, what is your favorite game? My favorite game is The Curse of Monkey Island. probably the same as most people my age who are gamers is that we're all quite weird <laughs> and um video games sort of was still that kind of it was still very niche it wasn't really the kind of mainstream hobby that it is today yeah well, uh, like, like what age were you then when that kind of started happening oh, across, well, it's a weird one so I, I wrote about i've covered this in, in a previous article i did i i have this weird Thing where it's like the closest the doctors have ever come to it is a form of PTSD, um, where I I have no memory of anything before the age of twelve. So I basically run on everything that people and my family have told me. Um, so I think the first the first time I the first console I got I believe was the Sega Master System two or maybe it was the first one the one that had Alex Kidd built into it hmm. I, think I was pretty sure it was the first it was either the first one or the second one it had that weird flip top lid which I thought was incredibly odd hmm. but um yeah that was that was the first console that I actually owned that was mine um I mean my dad was a fairly big gamer kind of growing up he had um he had a Mega Drive he had the, uh, an Amiga a Commodore um all stuff that I've kind of collected hmm. over the years um but that was the first console that was that was mine um and yeah, Alex Kidd was was really the the first game that I played on console. Um, I then kind of progressed onto the Mega Drive, um, and then from there I I really got heavily into PC gaming. Um, and it's that's I think that that is really where kind of my real passion for for video games really came came for, you know to the the forefront. Just was like, yeah, wow, this is amazing. I never realised that there was something out there that could make me feel like this or could give me this much enjoyment 
Mm, mm. Like, was there any other games around your childhood that, you know, kind of, you know, thought, oh, okay, this is awesome? It's again. It, it pretty much ties into what my favourite game is. It was it was the Monkey Island series. I mean, I was a huge. I still am a huge fan of Lucas Arts. Rest in peace, Disney you monsters, um, <laughs> for completely destroying that you know massive part of my childhood. Um, but I, I grew up on on adventure games um, and point and click adventure games. It was something that always attracted me. Um, when I was when I was younger, I, I probably don't. Do, no, I definitely don't do anywhere near as much as I do now. I used to read a lot. I would consume like books like anything I would, you know, in the evening. I didn't grow, grow up with like a TV in my room or I didn't have a console for, for quite a while, but books were what I consumed. What, what, so, what, what books were you reading? Do you, do you oh, Jesus Christ. One, well, the one that immediately springs to mind, and this is so embarrassing, the famous five series by Enid Blyton. I blasted through so many of those kids drinking cream soda with ah. a dog on an island and there was... But yeah, it was again, I think it was that it was that whole thing of, you know, there are these kids and they just go out on adventures yeah. and they find themselves adventures. So there were those and then from there I kind of progressed on to Ian Livingston's wonderful Fine Fantasy series, you know, the Choose Your Own Adventure books. And then from there, once I headed over to PC Gaming, it's like, hey, there's a whole series of video games um, that are basically almost exactly like this. You know, you're a character, they put you in a scenario and then rather than, you know, as well as just having this for the most part fantastic narrative journey um that you get taken across there are all these puzzles and, and mind benders in the way which just really appealed to me you know it's just like and especially as well i mean lucas arts are always very good at this there, there's only a certain degree of logic that'll uh progress you through a, a point and click adventure game sometimes you just have to get out a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle um in order to progress through life and I think that's a good motto for. for that's, life. That's, 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 that's not so much a motto. That's as much as a life metaphor. It is. Sometimes <laughs> you just have to get a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle. <laughs> that's the first time I think I've ever heard that because, to be honest, like I've never really played Monkey Island. Uh, oh, series. you monster! <laughs> uh, hey, hey. To be fair, there's going to be a, a ton of games in this series that I have not played in my life ever. True. I, yeah, yeah. I and yeah. it's going to be a nightmare trying to, <laughs> you know, ask questions about these games that I don't know. Whereas, where there's going to be games um, where I can just ask, oh, cool, I play that, or I can just be like, oh my god, I love this game so much. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the inevitable Last of Us episode. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how long is the next one you've scheduled for? Is going to talk about The Last of Us. <laughs> you have to schedule it in between, so every other episode you at least got something that you could you, you feel like you can really engage with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Rather than listening to one of us ramble about how good LucasArts is. <laughs> um... Which brings me kind of back to a point um, you brought up um, when you were reading. Like, were you reading any, like, you know, games magazines around the time you started gaming? Or? Uh, l- later on, actually, I think it, it mostly started sort of coming around when I when I had kind of more disposable income. Um, for me, again, the, the Master System was the first games console I owned, and then I had an Amstrad Power PC, which I'm sure maybe one or two people listening to this might remember. It was basically like a home computer, but it had a sliding panel at the front, um, and it had an inbuilt Mega Drive, hmm. which was amazing. It was, you know, it was fantastic. You know, it didn't have to bother faffing around with having, you know, owning a Mega Drive as well as a PC. You just swipe the thing over and then you just plug in. So I could jump from LucasArts games to playing Streets of Rage in like an instant. It was amazing. Um, but then, um, probably the, my next console from there was the PlayStation 1. Um, and I th- again, I think this is definitely something that most people our age probably are familiar with is the uh, PlayStation magazine and mm. the stack of demo discs that oh. you would accrue. Um, yeah. And that was, yeah, that was the real incentive for me was kind of picking up, you know, um, official PlayStation magazine and you get the demo discs and I would just play them constantly like i remember playing tomba over and over and over again <laughs> medieval as well i think the demo disc that kind of stands out for me from that kind of era is like there was this demo disc featuring a demo for a kind of not destruction derby but it was kind of mad max-esque um what was it called v- vignette or uh i think like- i remember what you were talking yeah 
Yeah, that demo for that. I, mm-hmm. Like, do forgive us, listeners, with, with, with kind of slightly cloudy. <laughs> with, with, with this it was question. years, years ago. It, it was like at least nearly. Oh my god! I'm just. It's just dawned on me. It's nearly twenty years ago. Oh yeah. my god! Um, and then not not only the demo for that. There was also the demo for um, Metal Gear Solid mm-hmm. and a trailer for maybe Silent Hill. Yeah, that was the weirdest one as well. They used to used to get demo discs and they would have trailers on it as well. It's so weird to think nowadays that, I mean, de- demo. You still, I mean, obviously we've still kind of got demos. You can just download them straight from from a digital store these days. You know, yeah. it's built into your console. You don't have to go out and buy a magazine in order to play these. Um, but you get trailers on them as well for games. Like nowadays, trailer comes out, you just go straight over to YouTube. Exactly. Yeah. Load up the minute it comes up. But if you hear that there's a trailer coming out, you have to wait for the next you know, PlayStation magazine to come out and then you have to go and buy that and then you have to put it in your console and then you have to load it up. But the dev- again, the demo is the same as you. Like, I can, I can, I can't, rem- I can never really remember specific games except for those three cloner as well I played to death. Mm. But I always remember numbers of discs. Like, demo one is just iconic. Everybody yeah. knows demo one, you know, the black disc. Um, but demo 17 was another favorite of mine. Demo 18, demo 23. Um, it's, it was weird. It, it kind of had this, um, it's almost like a very underground hip hop feel to it, you know, people with like mixtapes and stuff. So, but rather than your mates kind of, I mean, you would, you'd share your demo discs around with your friends, but it was, you know, this very kind of, oh yeah, man, have you played, you know, the latest demo, you know, demo 64? And they're like, yeah, man, that was really cool. Oh, you've got to check out demo 32. And it was, it was so, it was so hip hop. It was unbelievable. I loved it. Believe it or not, like, I think OPM in the US kind of had that underground kind of feeling for it. And it was that hip hop, uh, kind of esque, you know, feed into it because I, I remember watching a video a while back of um, a video the old US OPM did and it had a video of the unveil of the PlayStation 2 and it had that hip hop underground feeling kind of to it. Like, I, like I know I'm talking about a video, but nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Like, but yeah, that was really when I first kind of started branching out into into reading, you know, more stuff around. I mean, obviously, there were cheap books and stuff, and I've still got, like, a few of them knocking around for, for old years. It's just astounding. I'm a hoarder. Um, but, uh, yeah, OPM was really kind of the first the first actual kind of gaming magazine that I really kind of got stuck into um, and would read from, you know, from cover to cover and would just and reread and, and go back and, you know, read old issues. And it was just amazing you know that there were these knowing that the, you know there were people out there who were writing about these games so eloquently and were just as passionate about it as as uh, as i was mm. Mm. Uh, like were there any others down the line or was that or was opm kind of I, you know, the best yeah part? i was i mean i was pretty much a sony kid for a long while you know yeah. I, um, I, think, I think a lot of people were sony yeah you kids. know i was yeah i was ps i mean ps1 then went to ps2 i bypassed the original xbox my my brothers had one um and then i jumped to the xbox 360 um i would i think i picked up a couple of issues of game master maybe yeah like back in the day but i I mean opm was pretty much the the one that i always kind of gravitated to i do I, i i find myself occasionally actually it was probably a couple of years ago where I would go through periods of, um, actually it was, it was around the time we were starting, um, starting up stick twiddlers. Mm. I would go and I would just buy just a wide array of different kind of gaming magazines and just kind of get a feel for people's writing style. You know, by, you know, by the time we'd launched stick twiddlers, I'd only really been writing for myself and hadn't really been, um, you know, kind of really writing about video games. And, you know, I was like, well, there's all this content online and it's great and you can access that, but, it's always nice to have something physical and something offline and you can just kind of flick through and tear out bits and pieces and kind of go, yeah, that was a really cool piece and focus on it. So I, I did, I went and just bought like pretty much every, every single game and magazine that was there in front of a store. And I just sat there and just flipped through and read from cover to cover it was like, what kind of features do I really like? What kind of previews? How does this go? And it definitely really helped me kind of hone my, my writing skills and, and definitely kind of the way that, um, I write and, and the way that we craft features today, which is really awesome. Hmm. So yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, f- I think you'll be fine. <laughs> um, just talk about the origins of stick twillers and how you set that up. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a funny one. <laughs> well, I find it funny anyway. So um, 
I um, I started writing um, a personal blog. God, when I mean, we launched in 2010, so this must have been mid 2009. Um, basically, just writing any old bits and pieces. Um, there are I mean, with a couple. Most of it was trash. I mean, most people who kind of write. I, I'm not actually. I won't say that. I'll just dismiss everybody. But anyway, my personal blog I wrote was primarily trash. Um, but there were a couple of standout pieces that I really like. There's a piece I wrote called University Challenged, which was basically a personal piece about my decisions not to go to university and. Um, you know how I feel like it you know there, there's certain situations where I feel like it's more applicable to go out there and value experience over other bits and pieces but um anyway what what kind of happened from there is um i I ended up signing up to Twitter um after putting it off forever because I thought that it was just a place for people to post wanky statuses about their lunch um which is still kind of is uh, uh, yeah it is. <laughs> Um, and found that there was a massive gaming community on there. I mean, I primarily joined, I think, was because of Kevin Smith. I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan, and he's he's obviously massive on Twitter. Um, yeah. He's actually, yeah, he was actually the first person I followed on Twitter. And then from there, I found that there was a huge gaming community, and then started following a few people, started chatting to a few people. Again, it, you know, it felt like the old magazine days and back with the old demo disc where you would kind of switch stuff, you know, trade stuff around and chat and share each other's games. But obviously, it's a huge worldwide network, which was awesome. Um, and I... I can't remember if I entered a competition or if I just asked, but Guy Cocker, um, who was at GameSpot at the time, had mm. a couple of tickets. Um, <laughs> what I later found was a couple of tickets only. Oh, no, it was a couple of tickets. So I took my friend Brad with me. Uh, a couple of tickets to the launch of Halo Reach in mm. London. Yeah. Um, and I got them. And I was like, that's amazing. So I went to... Uh, Went to Halo, the launch of Halo Reach in London, um, which is the first place I met um, Debbie Timmins and Nick Silversides from The Average Gamer. Yeah. Um, and from there, I thought, you know, this is something really cool for for a piece of blog content. You know, not every not every gamer um, gets to kind of see this and and what mm-hmm. kind of goes on at these launch events and what happens. So I scribbled up a a post um, and threw it up. I got horrendously ripped apart by Reggie Yates for making a really drunken sort of gang symbol. Um, <sighs> was emceeing which was quite funny I'm never going to lift that down um, but yeah I, th- I threw it up and then I posted it out on Twitter and I was like hey guys you know I went to the launch of, of Halo Reach and I wrote up my thoughts about it um, thought you might be interested and Alan Teeter uh, the now infamous Alan Teeter uh, got in touch um, on Twitter was like hey man you know I really like uh, I really enjoyed your article that you, that you wrote about Halo Reach he was Alan I don't know if he's still, he's probably not as big a Halo fan as he was back then, but back then he was, he was hardcore Halo. Mm. Um, he's like, yeah, I really, I really like the, uh, the piece you wrote. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of starting up a, a gaming website. I think he was currently, he was at that time, he was working on a site called, um, I think it was If Men Had Wings. What? Uh, who I have never heard of, um, until Alan said. Um, it's a bit of a weird name to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, stick twiddlers isn't that much better, but what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> but it makes more sense. Um, but yeah, he was like, yeah, I'm thinking of a uh, startup's website. Would you be interested in contributing to it? And I was like, yeah, cool. That sounds great. You know, taking my, my work away from this, well, my work, my writing away from this little personal blog that a handful of people read, mostly my mates, um, and sticking up on a website. Hmm. And I was like, cool. Um, and then I think it was um, a couple of the, was so he introduced me to um, Michael Williams, who is um, I think he's still over at Nerfed. He was yeah. my checked, yeah. Seven better arcade. Uh, yeah, so he's over there now. Um, he was there at the time, and um, he was like, "This is you know, this is Michael. He's he's currently uh, trying to help you know start this website. Uh, do you know HTML?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. like I know." He's like, "Do you know CSS?" And I was like, "Yeah, kind of." Um, and he said, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going away on holiday for like three weeks. Can you guys just like work out how to build this website? And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so Alan buggered off to the Canary Islands or wherever he was sunning himself for about two weeks and left Michael and I to, uh, he'd set up this, this WordPress thing, which was frankly bloody awful. And it's not, a, it's not much better than the one I've gaffer taped together now. Um, but he kind of left there's Michael kind of sketched together a, a few ideas and, and how it go and he just sort of left me alone with with the HTML and the CSS to build it out. And then Alan came back and was like, Yeah, yeah, man, this looks really good, this looks really good. Um yeah, I feel a bit shit about um, you know, just having anyone as a writer, you know, I feel like 
you know, we can really help like build something together here. Why don't we split things, you know, fifty one forty nine? And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> like, what, you, like, what does that even mean? He was just like, okay, fifty fifty. Um and then from there, yeah, we you know, we launched Dick Twiddlers. Um put up a few articles and then, you know, it really took off when we did the first um Stegex mm. uh, down at Eurogamer, which started off as what was meant to be a pub quiz um in the Pembroke that then turned into a three hundred person piss up um that has happened every year. With the exception of this year, unfortunately, but we'll be back. That, that's awesome here. I mean, like, I, I, I obviously told you this before we started, but like, you know how much I love that party. It's kind of unique for me in each, every party, so each and every year. So I'm, ho- I'm, I'm glad that you guys got to do it for the past few years, and I hope you guys will be back for next year, definitely. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said, like, we're, is it was you know as, as we kind of laid out in the post there was it was a, just a series of unfortunate events that just kind of led up to this year I and mean, it's it's gutting but you know we'll be back like it's it's nothing you know it's not it's not the end of it um, we enjoy it way too much um, the fact that it gives us an opportunity to raise the profile and raise money for special effects who we will do anything for them whenever we possibly can just because of the amazing work they do um and yeah just the feedback we get every year you know we the minute we put the post up um i checked the numbers earlier this afternoon like 700 people read that post like when it went up and i was like the capacity of the venue was only like 300 people so there are people out there who are reading this post you know about how stegets have gone down it just goes to show that it's just grown and grown and grown um every year so but yeah we'll be back right no worries about it Let's get into the main, you know, bones of it. Uh, your favourite game ever, The Curse of Monkey Island. You, you, you mentioned how much, you know, kind of um, point and click kind of grew, your love for it kind of grew. So, like, mm-hmm. was there any other aspects as to what drew you into Curse of Monkey Island uh, to buy it or whatever? What, what, what was it uh, that made you want to get it? I think it was really the next level of the series and kind of the next, especially the next level of, of the Monkey Island series for me, um, and point and click. You know, it was the first, the first Monkey Island game to feature voice acting, which I mean, Dominic Armato's voice as Guybrush Threepwood is iconic now. Like, you know, people are synonymous with his, his voice and that character. Um, and the the art style as well for it was completely different. You know, the the previous two Monkey Island games were it was all you know it was sprites. It was just you know very you know pixelated graphics. Um, even Full Throttle, which kind of was a pre you know precursor to the Curse of Monkey Island, um, was still the art style was was definitely upscaled, but it was still very kind of pixelated. But you were just dropped into this cartoon world. Um, where these characters that you've been playing as for, you know, two games have suddenly had a whole new level of life breathed into them. Um, and it was incredible, you know, to see Guybrush Street put there in his, you know, with his massive spindly legs and that weird, I still think Matt Lee's hair looks a little bit like Guybrush Street Um, <laughs> it's that quiff. It's wonderful. I wish he'd dye it blonde. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and that kind of elongated face and how everything was really kind of caricatured. Um, it was just amazing. Like it was, you know, it was, it's, it's imagine, it's how I would imagine a lot of gamers feel now when they kind of see the net, you know, next gen graphics. That was next gen graphics for, you know, a point and click gamer was going from this, you know, stuff like Manic Mansion and Day of the Tentacle and then going, here's essentially you living in a cartoon. Um, and engaging with these characters and they now speak to you it was just it was completely next level mm. and like not to, um like this was kind of while well, like you mentioned a couple of those you know games just there this was kind of at the time of when LucasArts was kind of going through this golden age not not just in terms of the studio's history but in terms of the genre cause, like there was these awesome point and click games like Monkey Island like Day of the Tentacle like um Grim Fandango. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it was, it's sad to kind of see it decline. I mean, the great thing about, especially the past year or so, is that it's making um, a comeback. Kevin Beamers, um, who actually has a game coming out soon called Schrodinger's Cat, 
um, and also produced um, and created a game called um, Hector and the Bag Carnage Bag Badge of Carnage. Um, did a great talk uh, 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 Edinburgh Interactive Festival a couple of years ago around the evolution of gaming and how you know, gaming needs to adapt or die and um, point and click being a prime example of that and Telltale Games did a wonderful job with that with the Walking Dead series mm. um, you know they, they released a couple they uh, released a new installment in the Monkey Island series yeah. uh, beforehand they did the Back to the Future game uh, they did Jurassic Park which we don't really talk about um <laughs> And then Walking Dead came out, and it was something that was incredibly current and popular at the time, but it was the, the mechanics had changed in a way that made it accessible not only to uh, veteran point and click adventure gamers but to new players as well mm. um, and it's you know it, it it picked up a ridiculous amount of awards um, and they 've kind of continued to do that and now, especially over the the past year, we're seeing more and more of a resurgence of the genre. Daedalic games in particular are absolutely amazing. Like, Europe are, are crushing it in terms of point-and-click adventure games. They have been instrumental in keeping that scene alive, and I'm, I still think that they, by far today, produce the best point-and-click adventure games. But yeah, Luca, I mean, LucasArts were killing it back then, but then, you know, it's... The problem, you know, with LucasArts, it, it became about profits. You know, it, you needed to produce content that that you know made money and it became less about that which sucked you know f for us as as adventure gamers and especially when you know lucas arts officially closed its doors earlier on yeah uh last year you know it was kind of very much the end of an era for us um but it was yeah it, it was an amazing time mm, yeah yeah um like Kind of like for me in terms of point and click, like I, I've only gotten into it thanks to Telltale and you know what they've done with you know The Walking Dead and, and The Wolf Among Us, mm -hmm. and like that that was that's kind of my first foray into the series with point or not series with the genre with mm -hmm. point and click because I, I I never really had a chance to you know game as a young man on a PC. Um, I think the own actually it's just coming back to me. The, like I did have a point and click experience, but it wasn't so much with an actual game like Monkey Island. It was much, I think it was an educational game. Right. And may have been something based on RE, like religious education. Yeah. Maybe. I'm trying to think. This may have been 15, 14 years ago. The the only one I remember, it wasn't to do with RE, it was kind of to do with maths. There was a game called Zoom Beanies. Hmm. Which I'm sure a few slightly older cult listeners will probably remember. These little weird little blueberry looking bastards, but they were just amazing. <laughs> um, I absolutely loved them, but yeah, that, it was it was a great game. But as you said, you know about Telltale, it's it's been great because they have kind of rejuvenated an interest in the genre. Um, and more and more people are going back and checking out these old games and finding out, you know, where you know, where they're, the roots of this genre are, and they're, you know, rediscovering all these old games. You know, it's, you know, Monkey Island managed to get itself um, a HD re-release, which is amazing. Like, you know, it's it's a cult, it's a cult series, um, you know, by far. I mean, Grim Fandango, prime example, this year announced, you know, HD re-release coming to, to all platforms, mm. um, which, as a, a LucasArts gamer, um has filled me with ridiculous amounts of hope. You know, if Grim, Grim Fandango, if this does really well, and I, I hope to God it does really well, it leaves the door wide open for all those old, that, all that old catalogue to get upscaled. Um, mm. Because I think the biggest barrier for a lot of younger gamers these days who didn't grow up with those games is graphics. Um, there's a huge obsession with graphics these days. And... I don't think you could stick a lot of them in front of a fantastic game like Manic Mansion and then go, yeah, this game's awesome. They'll be like, yeah, but it looks like crap. Um, that's, you are that's kind of part of the reason why I can't play Metal Gear Solid One anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing. You know, you can go back as far as Metal Gear Solid One, and that's you know that was way after all the polygons. Mm. But, um, but yeah, like you, you know, people still kind of go back to it, and you, you sort of put up that. It, it feels like a, an extra barrier. Um, against that now, whereas you know, if you if you got the opportunity to to bring them back and polish them up a bit, 
Um, it's definitely possible. What, you know, while I hate the amount of HD re-releases that are coming out, and I think it's predominantly because these are all games that we kind of grew up with, there are a few out there that, that are great to see come back. I mean, Abe's, Abe's Odyssey as well has just, you know, recently come back as well. And that wasn't, you know, it's not just a pretty reskin. They built that entire thing again from the ground up. Um, but it's such, you know, it's another one of those cult games. It's not point and click. Um, but it's still very kind of puzzle orientated. Um, that's, that's been reintroduced. Um, to a whole new generation of gamers who can fall in love with such an iconic character, um, and give it, you know, a new, a new breath of life. Mm. Like, let, let's talk about Guybrush, because, like, he is such, like, an iconic character for gaming in the 90s. You could probably compare him, or not even in, you know, something like the 90s, or, well. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say, <laughs> I'm trying to say is, like, he, he was among those, you know, icon, iconic characters, in games within the 90s, like, you know, the yeah. likes of Crash and Lara Croft, that's great. Absolutely. Like, I mean, he he was, again, he's, as you said, LucasArts point-and-click adventure games are really at their high there. Mm. Um, I mean, Curse of Monkey Island was, um, well, I mean, it was really the last, yeah, it was the last game in the series for a while. Um, yeah, it was the last game to come out on the Scum engine. Um, Ron Gilbert wasn't involved with it. Um, Tim Schafer wasn't involved. No, no, you'd say it was... Um, Heads up, oh, who are the project leads on it? Um, checking it, no. It's, no, it's John, uh, Jonathan Ackley and Larry Ahern. Mm. Um, and they, yeah, they worked on Tentacle, uh, Day of the Tentacles, Sam and Max Hit the Road, and, um, Full Throttle, Full Throttle. Actually, a lot of the, um, team from Full Throttle kind of went and worked on Curse of Monkey Island. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was, um, I can't remember what we were talking about. I got so caught up in... No, we were just talking about how iconic the character of Gay Bush was. <laughs> in, in, in that period where, you know, there was still characters like Crash and Lara Croft, to name a few anyways. Yeah, I, th- I think, again, it's uh, partially as well, you know, it's definitely to do with kind of the golden age of, of the genre at that time. Um, and I think as well to do with the sheer volume of games that come out these days. Um, we still, you know, have very, very iconic characters, but they're also pretty much the same in a lot of ways, um, which is just, it's a white dude with a gun, um, <laughs> and Lara Croft. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a weird time. I mean, Guybrush is just, he's very much, he's not your typical hero. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people related to him. He was just this completely hapless moron. Actually, a lot of the nineties kind of icons were hapless morons. Crash is a bit of a hapless <laughs> moron. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, who also happens to be a bandicoot. Um, <laughs> Abe as well. He was pretty iconic for the nineties. He was a hapless. Mo- yeah. Apparently in the nineties, it's all the ecstasy, man. All the ecstasy mm. and rape music. That's what <laughs> identified with hapless morons. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Guy, you know, Guy Brush was, you know, he was this guy and he wanted to, you know, he, he wanted to be a mighty pirate. That was his, his whole shtick. And, um, regardless of what anyone told him or what challenges, faced him that that was his end goal was like i'm one day i'm gonna be a pirate and i'm gonna fight the same zombie captain who will eventually become a demon captain and then back to a zombie captain over and over again um in this very kind of mario-esque he's gonna kidnap my girlfriend later wife elaine marley um and he'll you know he'll just leap through leap through fire for them but he's he's just a very entertaining character and there was just a lot of he was was just very much an everyman you know he was not this huge you know ripped muscle bound guy charging around a battlefield shooting people or leaping around it's just a lot to do with guns really and i mean it was it was he was guy brush he was just he was just a really dweeby guy who just happened to be a lot of the, you know, the stereotypical gamer at the time, I think, was just very much like Guybrush. I think that's why a lot of people identified with him. Mm, mm. Plus, we all want to be pirates. Pirates are fucking cool. <laughs> um, I didn't really have that aspiration, to be honest, as a kid. Like, really, I, I'm kind of sad at myself that I never got that. Like, all I, all I wanted to do, do as a kid is just play football. You want to play football? Uh, yeah. Well, I was... well that, was, that was the typical, you know, male kid, I don't know. This. Oh, no, I, was, I wasn't down with outside. <laughs> Very big. Um, inside was better. Uh, it was confined. And there were puzzles to do. Um, but yeah, that was. 
I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose that's it. Like, he, he just really, he's just a fantastic, I mean, Dominic Armato's voice for it was just spot on. I mean, he's, he's been brought back again and again, you know, he's, he's as tied to that character as anyone. It's, it's weird looking at kind of the cast for Monkey Island, the fact that Dominic Armato's really the only one who hasn't branched out anywhere near as much, um, in terms of, you know, variety of, of follow up roles. Dominic's always just kind of done, he's like, I'm Guybrush and that's kind of it. Um, he's done other bits and pieces, but that's, that's very much him. Um, and the two go hand in hand, but he's, again, he's, he's very much just kind of like your everyday average Joe, like most, most voice actors are, you kind of look at them and except for Nolan North is just some weird hybrid creature from another planet of really attractive men who also have an immense, immensely talented ability to do a variety of, of obscure voices. Yeah. Um, I'm convinced he, yeah, he's some next level mutant. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't adhere to that cookie cutter voice actor at all. But yeah, Dominic Armato was, and Guybrush are definitely still a, a, a heroes in my eyes, like even to this day. And, le- and like we touched upon how Curse wasn't, well, or not so much wasn't as it was the first game in the series without, uh, Schaefer, or Ron Gilbert, or, uh, and like, since like, after obviously they left LucasArts, they went on to, you know, find Double Fine. Uh, and, mm-hmm. well, well, Gilbert did his own thing. Schaefer went on to find Double Yeah, Fine. Gilbert well, wandered off into his own little weird, grumpy obscurity for a bit. Yeah. Um, which is fine. Yeah. And, oh, although Gilbert did join Schaefer. Well, he he did. So. He's come back. It's good. It, I mean, it's great to, you know, it, it was the same thing when you kind of looked at Curse of Monkey Island, especially with the LucasArts count. I mean, it's primary because they're all at LucasArts. But the team always kind of stuck together. And I mean, even the voice, the voice actors for Curse of Monkey Island have definitely still crossed paths here and there over the years. Mm. Um, but yeah, Tim, Tim Schaefer and Ron Gilbert just kind of go hand in hand. Um, and it's always great to kind of, you know, whenever you hear that they're going to work together, I mean, the cave was brilliant. Like it was, it was completely unexpected really from what everyone thought it was going to be. It was like, oh, they're going to make a new point and click adventure game. And it kind of was, and it kind of wasn't, you know, it was this, you know, it comes back to this whole, you know, the, the genre needed to adapt. Mm. Um, and that's what the cave was. And I, I frankly think it's brilliant. There's some people who don't rate it very highly. Um, I think the character, you know, it's got all those quirky characters that you, that you want from, from a, an adventure game. Um, it's got some really fantastic puzzles. Um, and the, the narrative is just so weird. So very, very weird. Um, and it's, it's great. You know, it feels in some ways kind of very much like a, a successor or a spiritual successor to something like Day of the Tentacle. Mm, I mean, like, I know Gilbert's left Double Fine now. Like, he left, uh, last year after mm-hmm. the cave. So, uh, I know he's back off doing his own thing now doing iOS games, is it? Can't mind. Yeah, yeah. He's released a couple so far. <laughs> Oddly enough, pirate themed. Um, there's a couple of people. I haven't really checked it out. I'm not, yeah, I think he's kind of done a, it's kind of an array, really, in in terms of sort of taking a bit more of a step back away from from games as a whole. I think he's he's an odd he's an odd character, um, mm. but one I respect massively and would more than happily sit down and bend his ear for numerous hours um, about Monkey Island and everything else that went down at LucasArts. Same for Tim Schafer as well. I'd love the opportunity to chat to him. That's pretty much me with Naughty Dog and The Last of Us. Right mm. now. Although I know, I know I got to do that recently when I talked to Neil Druckmann, but like, oh. that's, 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 that's pretty much me. Anyways, like, that's <laughs> Is that it. you're done now? You, you can retire gracefully. You're like, I'm done. That's it. Pinnacle reach. No, uh, definitely <laughs> not. Definitely not. Because like, I only, I only got half an hour on that call. God damn it. Oh there's, my God. N- there's never ha- enough time to ask all questions in the world about la- the last of us, but mm. uh, but I digress. I, di- I but I digress. I'm getting away from the point. <laughs> and like and like as well as well, uh, like we mentioned Tim Schafer as well as well as Double Fine and you know kind of the resurgence of point and click. We have to talk about Broken Age as well. Yes, because like that, that that's kind of come up in a big way because it was you know at the time the biggest you know crowdfunded game on, or on Kickstarter and it was yeah as a f- Few million put into it. Um, so three point four five million. Yes, yeah, it's a lot. Um, it, to be honest, it doesn't feel like it should have cost that much um, for something that's taken this long to kind of come out. Broken Age. Broken Age was an interesting game for me. Um, I mean, the minute it came up, 
again, I'm a suck. Th- this is how you suck money out my wallet. You tell me that Ron Gilbert or Tim Schafer are making a new point and click adventure game. I'll give you whatever I have in my wallet at that time. <laughs> Um, and I, in the case of Tim Schafer, I won't bother you for about a year or so as to whether or not you actually deliver on it. Um, but yeah, Broken Age was a weird one for me. I felt like it started off, it, the beginning felt really slow. Um, and again, there's, there's, I think a lot of it ties back down to the evolution of, of point and click again. I felt like this took a bit of a step backwards. Um, you know, Telltale have done a really good job of, of integrating modern control mechanics into the point and click genre. Um, Broken Age, it's all, it's all one button input. It's like, it's almost like it's developed for mobile. Um, in the sense that you just literally push things and that's kind of it. You know, it, it doesn't have the level of complexity, um, that, that a lot of, a lot of kind of veteran point and click gamers would, would want from, from a game. Um, it, it felt kind of like you were just pushing a story along as opposed to being actively engaged with it. There was no point where I, I really felt kind of, oh, you know, I, I really want to play this and I want to finish this. And yeah, I, I really want Act 2. Act 2 looks like it's going to pick up in a big way. I really like, you know, and that's one I liked how they kind of um, flick between the two characters. For, for those who don't know, Broken Age is set between two different characters, a male and there's a female character, mm. and they're, they're both in different time periods. And throughout the game, you can actually switch between them. So if you get stuck, or in my case, bored um, of playing one character... Um, you can switch over to the other and then eventually you'll reach a certain point and it will force you back over to the other one. Um, and then by the end of the game, something happens. I won't spoil it. Um, and then part two is going to happen. But yeah, by, by the end of part one, part two looked like it was going to pick up in a, a lot, a lot better way. But yeah, I, I really wasn't, I wasn't impressed with Broken Age. It didn't leave me thinking this is, this is what I would expect from, nece- well, necessarily this amount of money. I mean, money doesn't necessarily fuel creativity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not what, what I would have expected from, from something that Tim Schafer had produced. Um, it was a bit of a letdown for me. I don't know. Did you, have you played it? What did you think? I, I've not had a chance to play it yet. I know I did, um, a couple of new stuff on it for V247 while I was there when it was announced and I had a big, you know, op ed on it, on how mm. it was kind of, not so much, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to find, not, the op ed was kind of focused on how there was kind of parallels to it and what mm-hmm. Radiohead did with In Rainbows. Not so much in that, you know, it managed to raise oh so much money for X and Y or whatever, because, like, if anything, I think there wasn't really that much money spent into <laughs> In Rainbows when it came out. Like, it was, if you remember, it was kind of a pay what you like model. Yeah. But, but it was so much the occasion of it, like, Radiohead managed to skew its uh, former record label, like Par- Parlophone, and like up until like the physical release, I don't know, it was like there was no uh, record label for In Rainbows, and it was only a few months later that the album did get a uh, release, physical release through XL Recordings. But up until then, there, like there was no uh, record label, and the same could be said of um, Double Fine because like they had no publisher, like they had no mm-hmm. THQ for um, its games it had no Microsoft uh, game studios for its games like Iron Brigade or or, or in the case of THQ Stacked mm-hmm. or EA Partners and uh, for something like maybe you know to do you know Brutal Legend too that was the game I was going I was thinking of by the way um, yeah Brutal Legend was bloody good though yeah, yeah yeah I mean like I have Brutal Legend here somewhere but I've yet to play it I've play it man just don't like ev- just people just get hung up on this whole it was a huge controversy around it they're like oh you know it's going to be this action game mm. and they're like oh it's not an action game it's an RTS and it's like it's not really either of those things <laughs> um, and I mean the RTS elements aren't really RTS elements you know it's a bit like you know, it's like calling us, you know, the Assassin's Creed, a uh, you know, flipping tower defense game. It's not. Technically, it's Assassin's Creed was tower defense in Revelations. A little bit. A little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's you know, it's it's like drawing a comparison to that. It's it's a fantastic game. Like it's it's so. It again, it's one of those. It, it brutal legend feels like the game that Tim Schafer should have gone away and and made with that money. You know, in terms of. Saying we're gonna revive, you know, the the heart of point and click, 
Mm. Brutal Legend holds a lot of that. Not in the sense of the actual core gameplay or the genre, but in terms of the characters, you know, it's got memorable characters. It's funny as hell. The dialogue's great. The story's great. Um, it's, yeah, it just, it couldn't, Tim, Tim seems to have this thing where he can't seem to quite get all the pieces of the puzzle to fit together in terms of this is how I can, how we can make like a really, really great game. You know, Brutal Legend was kind of missing. It, it A lot of people didn't really understand what it was trying to be. And Broken Age was a case of it's trying to be point and click, but it's missing a lot of the key elements. You know, there are no memorable characters, with the exception of the wolf. Um, there are no, you know, there's no real kind of funny dialogue. There's no, you know... Great. I mean, the story's okay so far. Like I said, I think it's going to pick up in part two, but there was nothing there that really gripped me in terms of this is going to be amazing and pushing it forward. Going back to Monkey Island then, to mm-hmm. kind of tie that into uh, Bow and all that, what out of, what, what, how, how would you rank the series in terms of each installment? Like, obviously, you know, Curse would come first, but like, what about the rest of the games? Um, de- well, yeah, so Curse first. I mean, it's, you, you kind of got to put the first Monkey Island second just because it's the one that started it all. Mm. Um, LeChuck would definitely come after that. Um, then we had Escape from Monkey Island, which was released on the PC and it got a console port and I don't know why. Um, it was not great. Um, and then he had Tales of Monkey Island, which was the episodic release from Telltale Games. I would put Tales above Escape from Monkey Island, oh. um, just because, yeah, I t- Escape es- Escape suffered the same the same issue as the Broken Sword series did um, when the rise of console gaming came around, especially on the PS2, which is the a lot of these studios and a lot of these publishers were still trying to keep the genre alive and they were trying to deal with analog control input um, and how to handle that. So a lot of it branched out into, again, you know, taking away the kind of point and click aspects and moving the characters around. But that in turn changed the way that you would interact with puzzles and interact with the environment. To be honest, I think it's especially, you know, games like that are probably a lot of a precursor for stuff like Uncharted, where you still kind of have puzzle elements into it these days, um, but have kind of adapted to to that control style. Um, but it, it just didn't work for the series at all. It, it hasn't really worked for any point-and-click game. Walking Dead and, and what Telltale's, Telltale have done have have kind of made it work, but that's because they've sort of flipped the entire thing on its head, really, in terms of puzzle mechanics. It's... It's, it's completely fresh. It's not trying to work out what it is. Um, and it blends really well. But yeah, um, I would rank Telltale. But yeah, Tales, yeah, so it would go Curse of Monkey Island, Monkey Island 1, Monkey Island 2, uh, Revenge of the Chuck, um, or the Chuck's Revenge, um, then Tales of Monkey Island, then Escape from Monkey Island. What games, other games besides Curse that, uh, you feel that are up there for you? Um, We'll, we'll, we'll stick to the past for a bit. Broken Sword. Mm-hmm. Um, the first Broken Sword and Broken Sword 2. Just fantastic games. Revolution Software. Fantastic job, Charles Cecil. I would, and the fact they've managed to bring it back. Um, Broken Sword 5 is incredible. It's, it's not, it's, it's not a touch on the original games, but it's such a far cry from. I don't think, you know, you can really, it's, it's hard to recapture that magic again, especially when gaming as, as a culture, um, now is so different. Um, the Mass Effect series. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Mass Effect, Mass Effect one, the, the first one in particular was one that took me a while to get to grips with. Um, I, I, when I first got a 360, I used to go to game and I would just flick through stuff and Mass Effect was a game I would constantly pick up and look at it. I was like, Oh, it's Bioware. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, and I'd always put it back down and one day I just dove, like, bit the bullet, bought it, put it in, haven't looked back since. Like, I've, I've played those games back before. I mean, I'm sitting here, I've got a model ship of the Normandy next to me and a replica, well, it's, um, a Nerf gun that has been painted with N7 customization <laughs> that Mandy got me for, I think it was my birthday or it might have been Christmas. 
um, a couple of years ago. And um, a Cody Bakaya statue of Liara Tassoni. So yeah, you could say I'm a fan. Um, but like, yeah, I lo- like like what 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 game would you say? Out of the three, out of the three, would you rank? Because everybody else, like, well, most people would rank Mass Effect two. Like, I would, I don't know. Um, I I want to say two. Mass Effect one had a lot right with it. I mean, the you know the planetary exploration stuff was great. Mass Effect two really helped shift the combat around, and Dragon Age had a lot to do with that, in my opinion. Um, I, yeah. I think I still have to say two. Although three brought me to tears on several occasions, um, Adam, I was living with Adam at the time, and um, I don't know. It was, we could probably talk about spoilers for Mass Effect Three, right? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Song. Yeah. So when um, Morden dies, um, I bawled massively. I was I was basically grinding Mass Effect Three. Like it, I just wanted to get through. It. I think, and I got to that point, and I think it was about eleven o'clock at night. I've been playing since that morning. And um, it happened. I paused the game and I went downstairs and I passed um, Adam and John and they were like, you're right. I said, I need to go outside for like 10 minutes and have a cigarette because this just happened. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I was like, I can't talk about it. It completely it devastated me. But, you know, it's Bioware's writing. And again, you know, it's I, I think, again, it's one of the where that essence of point and click comes from is really great writing and really great characters that you're emotionally invested in. Um, and Bioware have always been really good about that, especially with the Mass Effect series. But yeah, I would, yeah, I'd probably put Mass Effect 2 as my number one, um, out of three, then the first Mass Effect and then Mass Effect 3 at the end. Um, just, I don't know why I put Mass Effect 3 at the end. I just would. I, I would probably have it 2, then 3, then 1. Be honest. Not 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 to say that they're all bad games mm. you know, or like you know they're known kind of middling in their own way. Like they're all fantastic mm. games, but like two is just such a step up from one as it obviously is. Yeah. But but three kind of refines on that. No, I can tell you why I put three down the bottom. Two words: space uh, farming. Uh. The flipping planetary resource. Uh, was the dullest thing ever. So um. boring, so boring, especially to a completionist like myself. It was like they, you know, they made such a big deal out of resources. It was like Fable Three when they were making such a big deal out of the economy. You know, they're making all oh, you got to get all the resources. I finished that game with more resources than I started with. I could have opened a country. I could have started my own planet. <laughs> Through the Reapers, we could have just bugged off in the Normandy. Like, guys, seriously, I've got enough for a whole new, you know, we'll, we'll start our own federation. It'll be fine. We'll just go off to Eve. We'll go off to Eve online. We'll trade it all. We'll be rich. Let's go for it. And that's how Firefly starts. Oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, right, let's move on from Mass Effect. Like, were there any others that kind of, you know, you know... Um. <laughs> Oh, I mean, basically any LucasArts game, <laughs> just all of them really. Um, Jade Empire is another game that really constantly, I always mean to go back and revisit it. Um, it's just a great, a, another great game from Bioware. Um, i trying to think what else is really kind of sticking out in my mind right now. Um, the Fallout series, Fallout 3 in particular mm. was really good. Um, Fallout New Vegas I've still yet to finish despite owning four different versions of the game um, because it bugged out on me on 360 so I bought the ult- the ultimate edition which I managed to play for an additional 20 hours before it bugged out on me um, and then I had the PS3 version which then bugged out on me and now I finally own the PC version and I'm going to mod the hell out of it so hopefully it won't crash and I'll actually get to see what happens <laughs> um, so yeah it would be really nice if Bethesda actually bothered to QA their games once in a while um, so we can finish it. But Fallout, Fallout 3, again, it's, it's a similar thing. It's just great stories, great characters. I've just always really liked RPGs. Like, like for me, like, with the first RPGs, like, I've, like, I've only played, like, Fallout 3, like, maybe four, five hours. Uh-huh. And with Fallout New Vegas, and this is a pretty much of a cardinal sin, I haven't played that for, like, <laughs> ten minutes. Well, that it, I'm not surprised it probably crashed out on you and died. No, I was actually playing on Xbox 360 at the time. And then, like, this was like two months after its release. I picked it up for 20 quid in game and I was like, right, I'm gonna play that. Like, oh, I'm just playing it for 10 minutes and like, I just put it out for something else. Not because it was bad or anything, but it was just, 
I don't. I can't really remember why I took it out. It's probably just release schedule. I mean, I, I think uh, that's a yeah. lot of the problem. I mean, it's why. It's. I mean, it's why I still to this day haven't played Skyrim. Um, but, but, I can't dedicate. I don't have. There isn't enough time for me to dedicate. There's too many good games out there to dedicate myself to one game and be like, <laughs> I'm just going to play that all the time. It's the same thing with MMOs as well. The closest in MMOs I've ever got to me playing was WildStar. And even that I've, I've kind of waned away from because it's like my, t- my gaming time's so limited. I don't want to be stuck committed to this one game. I would, I want to play everything. There's so, you know, especially now with the indie scene, you know, anyone, it's so easy now to, to kind of get your game out there, mm. um, and to play it. And people are always making really weird and wonderful stuff. And that's what I really like about it. Mm. And like, I like, like this coming back to Bethesda stuff, like, like Skyrim was the first, you know, proper Bethesda RPG that I really invested myself into it. Cause like, it was the same with Obli- uh, Oblivion, like, in terms of Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas playtime. Mm-hmm. Like, it was something like four, five, <laughs> maybe six hours at most on PS3. Mm-hmm. But with Skyrim on Xbox 360, I played that, like, the day before it came out, thanks to game, you know, giving me my copy early, like, <laughs> um, like I played that, like, something like eight hours straight. Well, wow. like, like after I got off work, and I was playing that eight hours straight, and it was like six in the morning, an hour before I started uh, writing uh, Nolodesia for VG247, like, oh, that kind of flew by. <laughs> <laughs> it's that wonderful moment where you look out the window, realise the sun's coming up, you're like, wow, I should probably go to bed. Yep, only, no. I Except, to... no, I have to go to work now. Exactly. Yeah, but I, I mean, I had that with Fallout 3, you know, I, I would play that for hours and hours on end, and I neg- Collected a lot of time on on other things, which really sucked. Um, it was the same, you know. Even with kind of my tradition from trade, I mean, I was always after kind of the the PlayStation and the PlayStation Two. I was always very much a PC gamer. Then I started moving around a lot. I had to give up my rig, and I've only just got back into it this year. But then, you know, when the Xbox 360 and the PS3 came out, I picked up the 360, and the majority of my time was pe- spent playing online multiplayer because that was the big thing at the time. You know, I would play so much Halo, um, I'd play a lot of a lot of Battlefield, a lot of Battlefield, um, and then kind of as it went down, uh, my my you know gaming time went down, and there were more and more games being put out. I was like, well, I want to spend my time playing these great single player campaigns, you know, these amazing stories that are coming out. Um, people, uh, it's not perfect. L- I, I think LA Noir, if it got a sequel, would, would have been amazing. I so think, good. I, I think we'll get a sequel to LA Noir. I, I hope we do, anyways, because that was a bloody gem of a game. I don't care about the criticisms it got. I thought, you know, for a good, for a first game, it was really good. Absolutely, like it was. It definitely had its faults. It was oh, no yeah. near perfect. I mean, Cole Phelps is a very, very angry man yeah. for not a very good reason most mm-hmm. of the time. And not to mention, the ending was kind of. Shit. Oh yeah, the it it wasn't great to be honest. Yeah. Um, but as you said, it's it's a first game. You know, there's pl- there was plenty of potential they could have taken with that, and you know, finding your feet with it. Yeah, he, he, I'm hoping that when they do the sequel, if they do the sequel, they'll fix a lot of its faults, including that interrogation system. Yes, that, I mean, that was the worst bit. Like, I mean, we I published a guide, but you can kind of work it out in terms of what you need to press. Um, I didn't even, I, I rarely bothered looking at what their reactions were half the time. I was like, do I know this information? It's, it becomes, again, kind of just, it's a button-pushing game. It doesn't really become much else. Hmm. Um but yeah, it was. I mean, it was a great looking game. The setting was fantastic. The characters were reasonably well developed for the most part. Um, but yeah, if it get, I I think if it got a sequel, it would be a bloody amazing game. Mm. So if I if I had to guess your top three, your top three would be Curse, then Broken Age, and then Mass Effect Two. Would that be correct? My top three uh, for not what? Broken Age. Uh, yeah. Top three games ever. I, I said they're Broken Age, but I meant Broken yeah. Sword. Broken Sword. So yeah, Curse of Monkey, uh, Curse of Monkey Island, yeah. Broken Sword, and then Mass yeah. Effect Two. That'd be your top three. Um, I'll put in Mass. Yeah, we'll put Mass Effect Two in there just because a Mass Effect title needs to be represented. Because otherwise, it would just be a list of LucasArts games <laughs> um, from the nineties. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I would definitely put those as my top three. So if you've enjoyed listening to me ramble with Johnny, um, I also ramble with some other idiots.
on some other pod, not that Johnny's an idiot, um, <laughs> <laughs> on some other pod, or on another podcast, uh, it's inventively called the Stick Twiddlers podcast. You can catch us on iTunes or over on sticktwiddlers.com. Um, yeah, and, and visit the site. We publish up features, uh, reviews, previews, um, and there's occasionally some YouTube videos up from Alan when he can be bothered, um, including the wonderful Al vs. Snare series, in which he plays old Super Nintendo games and gets incredibly angry. One time he broke a chair. It was quite funny. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Johnny, for, for having me on um, and for letting me talk about my love for monkey island because alan i don't get this with alan he he tells me to shut up every time i start talking about it Thanks for listening to my favourite game. Next week, Louise Blaine on Assassin's Creed 2. Till next week, bye bye.